And now I'm delighted to introduce today's keynote, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Jerry Craft, 2020 Kirkus and Coretta Scott King winner for the graphic novel, New Kid. In 2020, Jerry also won the Newbery Award for the first graphic novel ever to win with New Kid. Um, he's also the creator of the multi-starred class act and rumor has it that there is a third book in the trilogy, which I cannot <laughs> wait to read should it become available. Um, he's also created numerous picture books, graphic novels and middle grade novels. He's no, also known for his syndicated newspaper comic strip, Mama's Boys. Now, Jerry, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Okay, thank you. And it is, it is such a pleasure of all the times that I've been to BookFest as a fan watching legends like Jerry Pinckney and others. And now to come back as a keynote is absolutely uh, a dream come true. So thank you for having me. So um, what I'm going to do is I have a slideshow that I'm going to show. And OK, do you see this? Do you see my little presentation up? I just want to make sure you're not looking at a blank screen. OK. so. Okay, so I am Jerry Kraft, and I am the author and the illustrator of New Kid and Class Act. So, you know, my, my journey has been very interesting. So this is, this is the life of Jerry Kraft, but don't worry, this is the Cliff Notes version, because the regular version goes about seven hours, and I know that we are on kind of a time constraint. So I have always, always, always loved to draw. Um, there is really nothing since I was a kid or even now as an adult that I love as much as drawing. The one thing that I did not like to do was read. Uh, books were actually pretty scary to me. I could read, I just never liked to read. And I think that it happened very early on in my life because I did like to read Marvel Comics. I was a big comic book fan. And my teachers hated us reading comics because they thought that they would rot our brains. So, you know, what do you do with that? You know, when the thing that you love to do, your teacher's like, no, that's not good for you. You know, I'd rather eat a bowl of candy than read a comic book. So the stuff that I like to do, they frowned upon. But the things that I had to do for class I had no idea why I even needed to read these books because I, I never even developed the, the skill to appreciate books like that. I didn't know what I was looking for. All I knew was that most of the books that I had to read in school um, were written by authors 50 to 100 years before I was even born about characters I seemingly never wanted to meet, places I never wanted to go. Um, and any character that looked like me was not living their best life. So I had no mirrors, uh, sliding doors, only windows. And those windows were kind of foggy most of the time. When I look at a book like American Tragedy, I had to read that in, uh, I would say, about the 11th grade. And do you know what the biggest tragedy of that book was? It was 800 pages long. So when I tell you that I had more confidence that I could ride to California on my skateboard than to read an 800 page book, I really mean that. And in, in a lot of ways, it, it really brought books as almost a foe. You know, there was, there was no like nothing that I felt like I could connect with them. So I had a very interesting uh, thing with reading, even the library. I did grow up in Washington Heights. I was born in Harlem, grew up in Washington Heights, like Jordan Banks from New Kid. And the libraries back then were like something after a Harry Potter movie. You open the door and it would just creak open and you go up these stairs and that's all you would hear is your footsteps. And you'd go there and you'd look around and all the books were covered in plastic and all the chairs were covered in plastic and the librarians were covered in plastic. And it, it was just a an uninviting place. Now I go to libraries and the librarians are actually involved with the kids, there are colors, there are computers, there's books, there's you know, comfortable seating. And that was, not, that was not my life. 
Um, it really wasn't until about 11th grade that I found the first character who was as close to a mirror as I had ever gotten. And believe it or not, that was Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. So how does a young black boy from Harlem end up connecting with a kid named Pip from England? Well, I think the biggest thing is what was different than a lot of the books that I saw um, as a kid was that this character at least had expectations and the people around him had expectations of him. And that wasn't anything that I ever saw. Um, so I kind of identified with them, but more often or not than not, it was mainly identifying with someone like Peter Parker. You know, what my teachers didn't realize with Marvel Comics was that, you know, I had some pretty good vocabulary developed from those comics, from reading those comics. You know, every title was the amazing Spider-Man, the spectacular Spider-Man, the uncanny X-Men, the macabre man thing, and it was Tales to Astonish, and every week it was Armageddon and Annihilation. So by the time I could read, uh, by the time I had to read uh, Faulkner or Upton Sinclair, I could read it. I just didn't want to because I, I didn't know what I needed to appreciate. So now let's take a look at the mirrors, the mirrors of my youth. Um, whether it was an African-American family in 1850 or in 1950, it was pretty much the same. There was a dad who always wore coveralls. I don't know why, you know, I kept looking in my dad's closet for coveralls and luckily I never found them, but it was a dad in coveralls and there was a son and a mom and a dog. And, you know, it might start off happy, but I quickly learned that even the happiest scenarios, you know, they were not long lasting. So, about 20 minutes into the book or a few pages into, you know, 20 pages into the book or, you know, 20 minutes into the movie, somehow dad inexplicably is out of the book. And then the mom rallies, okay, son, it's just you and me and the dog. And it's like, okay, so they found happiness and then something would happen and the mom is gone. And now it's just the kid and his dog. And he's like, well, you know, mom's gone, dad's gone. Come on, Sounder. It's just going to be me and you. Sounder, here, boy, here, boy. So that was my life as a trying to find a mirror. Um, why is it that every kid that resembled me had the weight of the world on their shoulders? And as a result, I was not a reader. There was almost, I would rather play, go outside and play. I'd rather play with my video games. I'd rather read comics. I would rather clean my room than have to look at that sad family again. And that was all I ever got. And it really, really developed habits that I could not break until I was an adult. So meanwhile, my counterparts, had actual heroes that didn't just save a neighborhood, they saved the world or even saved the galaxy. And if someone like me was in that, lucky enough to have a cameo, you know, it was just kind of like the sidekick. You know, maybe the comic relief, um, but never anyone that had a real part, you know, wasn't a real hero. They couldn't shoot beams through their eyes. They couldn't fly without the help of something else. So again, you know, let's go back to the video games or let's go back to imagining my own stories. And I think that's what really got me into making my own stories because I did not see the stories that I wanted to read. So on my website, I have in big bold letters, I make the stories that I wish I had when I was a kid. What would have made eight-year-old Jerry Craft the reader? So here's my life. Uh, again, I always love to draw. I did grow up in Washington Heights in New York City. I had a mom and a dad and they both lived with me. And I also had friends from around my block. So we were kind of like the little rascals and we did a bunch of things. So again, the 
notion of staying inside and reading as opposed to some of the things that I did, right? Because it was so different. For me and my friends, the only shots that we were part of took place in the basketball court, all right? Not in the books I read. You know, the only drive-bys was the Mr. Softy truck. Actually, the Mr. Softy truck did actually drive by my neighborhood because they were afraid. But we had like Rico Freeze, and that was the ice cream that we got. And we played football and basketball and skateboard and made up games and tag and freeze tag and hot peas and butter and rode horseback. Well, okay, not really the horseback. I just want to make sure you're still paying attention. But we did all those other things. So my imagination um, was really starting to come up with, you know, let's make up games. Let's make up this. Let's make up that. So, you know, because I wasn't getting it from elsewhere, from outside sources, we had to make up a lot of a lot of different things. So it brings us back to the sad African American family, and the fact that I still, uh, going into college, did not like to read. So, unlike Jordan Banks in New Kid, I did eventually go to um, an art school, and but that wasn't until college because my mom and dad did not want me to go to an art school because they had only heard the term starving artist and they thought that I would be living in their basement until I was 50. But um, I showed them uh, shortly after winning the Newberry, I moved out. Okay, so I'm on my own now, I'm a big boy. So anyway, I was at the School of Visual Arts and you know that was very interesting. And I remember one day going to Pearl Paint uh, in on Canal Street in Manhattan. And I had to do some kind of illustration for my class. And I had all these colorful design markers that I was going to buy because I was so excited to go back and draw with all these colors. Unfortunately, the only color that mattered was mine because believe it or not, they would not actually sell me those markers because they thought that I was going to use those markers and go and write graffiti all over the buses and the subways. So their way of cutting down the graffiti is to stop me from buying design markers, even though I showed them my School of Visual Arts ID. Didn't matter. Called the manager. Didn't matter. So in my mind, that's when I start to develop the sense of humor that would eventually lead to New Kid and Class Act because so much of what I write about is true. It actually happened to me. So whether or not you want to hear it doesn't mean that it did not happen. So now I would then go back home and do a cartoon where someone like me is going into an alley and the guy opens up and he's got design markers in his raincoat and chart pack paper and you know all these things that I was not able to buy. So I always used humor as a way to kind of mask a lot of the pain and anguish that was just kind of a day-to-day -day thing when you grow up like me. Um, so I created a comic strip called Mama's Boys because I always wanted to have kids, African-American kids, as just regular kids. Um, this is the story of a mom who, strange enough, owns a bookstore. Okay, even though I wasn't a reader, I knew the importance of reading. And she's raising her two teenage sons. But, you know, when I tried to get that syndicated from editors, I started getting, oh, it's too depressing. Or we already have Jumpstart. Or it's too similar to Curtis. You know, what else do you have? And then I started realizing that in the syndication world, and a lot of places, it was kind of like Highlander, where there could be only one. You know, there could be a thousand other different stories and 999 of them could be similar and that's okay. They would still get their book contracts and their syndication. But when it came to characters of color, specifically African-American characters, we already have that. So we're okay. Thanks, but we'll pass. Which brings us back to the sad black family. So, you know, was I able, was there even a market? for me, for
for someone like me to do these stories. And so here is an actual uh, rejection letter that I got. I had enough of them to wallpaper my house. This is back in 1995 when I tried to do a Mama's Boys book. And it says transfer, oh dear Jerry Craft, transferring the TV situation comedy format to newspaper comic strips should work, but somehow it doesn't seem to for Mama's Boys. And the prospects for further transferring it to a book that will sell seem to us to be in even dimmer. But hey, thanks for thinking of us and keep trying, but not really. So in this letter, it's saying not only is me doing a comic strip a good idea, but it's not even a good idea to try to do a book. So, hey, you know what? Post office is always hiring. So that was back in 1995. And that was when I actually gave up on being traditionally published. Uh, it was shortly after this because any letter that I got that wasn't a form letter, they took the time to tell me to give up, basically. Um, so I did and I didn't. I went to the library and uh, I got a book on how to self-publish because again, I could read and what reading was to me, because I was told early on that I could not enjoy reading, reading to me was always information. So I could read on how to self-publish, how to use Adobe Photoshop, how to invest in stocks, but it never dawned on me on a rainy Sunday or even a sunny Sunday that I could wake up and go, you know, I'm going to spend the day with a good book. Never dawned on me until I was an adult. So after I started to publish my own books, other authors who also couldn't get published started coming to me and say, hey, uh, Mr. Kraft, I can't get published either. Can you help me publish my book? So over about a 20 year span, I probably did about 30 different books picture books and chapter books and early chapter books and a graphic novel or two, because I thought that the only way was to self-publish because no one was interested in me, especially the, the big publishers. Well, one thing that Chris Meyer said earlier, did they really want me to write my story or were they looking for someone else wearing the mask of us to write my story? And it didn't seem like they wanted me. So now I'm a self-published author, but still an author. I start to do my school visits and, you know, I use that. I was like, you know what? I'm still pretty good, you know? Um, and one day I went to a school visit and I'm just exuding pride because I'm an author. And I go in and I say, hi, I'm Jerry Kraft. And she says, we've been waiting for you. Come with me, Mr. Kraft. And we go to this door and I'm expecting her to open up the door and there's going to be 400 screaming kids there. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. So I'm ready to, <clears throat> okay, here I go. All right, I'm on, it's showtime. And the door opens and there are no kids. And I look and there's no kids. And I look and there's no kids. And I look at her, she looks at me and I'm like, what? And finally she goes, Aren't you here to fix the copier? Wah, wah, wah. So I told her that I was not the copy repairman and that I was the author coming to instill the love of reading and confidence that up until 10 minutes ago I had to these kids. So, you know, early on, I realized that I would never be an author. I would always be the black author and I would do black books and I would stay self-published. So it wasn't until I had kids. So I had two kids. Well, I still have them. And um, I wanted them to be the readers that I never was. Um, so we would read, I made sure I'd read them bedtime stories every night. So I think we went from Dr. Seuss to Captain Underpants to Geronimo Stilton uh, then on their own, they started reading Wimpy Kid and uh, Percy Jackson and Harry Potter. Um, 
But then I started reading them like Wiz of Oz. Who knew that Wiz of Oz was a book? That was the first time I ever saw that. And then Holes and Budnap Buddy. And then I started to see these little shiny stickers on them. I was like, hey, I don't know what these stickers are, but the books are really pretty good. So I would go to the library and say, hey, you got any more of those with the little round stickers on there? Never realizing that in 10 years, I would actually get two of those shiny stickers, which is still pretty mind blowing. Um, so. In 2017, I signed with HarperCollins um, and they actually gave me the opportunity and said, hey, we believe in you and your story. And I had, when I tell you I had given up on that um, and I didn't even tell anyone because I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop. It wasn't until they posted it in Publishers Weekly and other people started saying, hey, you have a book coming out? I was like, Maybe because from those movies and those books, whenever anything happened good to a black character, something catastrophic happened immediately. So I was like, okay, I want to make sure that a meteor doesn't hit HarperCollins, that a meteor doesn't hit me, something. I was not sure until I saw that in, in Publishers Weekly. So I based a lot of it on my own life. So again, anyone that complains about my story they're complaining about my life, but they're actually complaining about their treatment of me. So my ability to tell my story is my, you know, that's what I, I'm going to do. Um, I grew up in a brownstone. This is the actual house where I grew up in Washington Heights. And this is the house where Jordan Banks grew up because I wanted to break the stereotypes of, you know, a kid living in a tough neighborhood and he lives in the south side of somewhere, the South Bronx, south side of Chicago, South Central. Like, dude, I play stickball uh, and I play with my Atari and my friends and we're just, this is what we do, okay? Um, I went to small private schools, all right? So this is my eighth grade graduating class. So I, I was Jordan Banks, all right? I was, I felt like all my friends were 13 with dark skin, five foot three with cool curly afros. And I was 12, three foot five, light skin with straight hair. So I was kind of a fish out of water. Not really, but a little bit. I didn't look like any of them, that's for sure. And then like Jordan Banks and New Kid, my parents sent me to a school in Riverdale called Fieldston. And now there are 110 kids in my class of which only 10 of us are African-American. And half of those kids had been in Fieldston their whole lives. So even though we were both African-American, we had nothing in common. You know, for vacation, I would go to Coney Island, they would go to the Cayman Islands. Nothing in common, all right? But they have every right to exist, as do I. And that's where I got the character of Maury from uh, in New Kid. So I was also told that, you know, the books written by Black authors are only for Black audience. So I never thought that I would have, you know, crossover or, you know, kids from all over because I was always told black books are for black kids. So when I got the opportunity from HarperCollins, I really thought that this might be my only chance, my one chance, my one opportunity. So I put as much stuff as humanly possible in. I put characters that I love, I put humor, I put story arc, I wrote it, I rewrote it, I wrote it again, I redrew it, I drew it again. Because I wanted to make it where kids would love it and adults would love it. You know, because again, I might not have ever gotten this opportunity again. Um, in January 2020, I got a call at 6.42 a.m. saying that it's the first graphic novel to ever win the Newbery Medal, which I had only really learned of a Newbery maybe 10 years prior. Um, so it wasn't even a dream that I had. I love it. Absolutely amazing. But I did not grow up with that dream. Uh, so the fifth African-American to ever win, along with Kwame Alexander, Virginia Hamilton, Mildred Taylor, and Christopher Paul Curtis, only the second book to win that and the Craig Scott King Author Award with Christopher Paul Curtis for But Not Buddy, one of the books that I read with my kids. Who knew? So it all came together. And you know what? It wasn't just 
black kids who liked the book. Who knew? They didn't tell me that that was possible. And now, three years later, New Kid is available in Romanian and Korean and Lithuanian and Taiwanese and Albanian and Greek and French. Who knew? That was something that was kept from me. So my life has actually far surpassed my dreams because my dreams were very limited. And then when uh, Class Act came out, again, surpassing my dreams because I actually had the number one and number two best-selling books on the uh, New York Times graphic books and manga list. So when school gets real, you can still show the world you're a Class Act companion to the Newberry Medal when a new kid Jerry Craft, New York Times, New York Times best-selling author. Who knew? And now there's all kinds of cool swag, a Jordan Banks sketchbook, and a jigsaw puzzle. And again, all the puzzles that I did with my family as a kid, I don't think I ever saw a single African American character. So it's amazing some of the stuff that um, I didn't realize that I was starving for as a kid. And there are kids starving for that. So um, my editor, Rosemary, and Andrew, my first editor, I want to thank you tremendously for giving this young kid from Harlem, uh, a former reluctant reader, just the ability to, um, to share my gift with the world. Um, now, what I, I have one more thing that I want to show. And I actually have, let's see, this is a, an actual letter that I got uh let's see no nope, you can't read this this is my this is the script for new kid three so you can't read that let's see and here it is i got this the other day this is hi jerry i'm an english teacher in brazil and i've had the chance to read your new kid with my sixth graders throughout this year it's been an amazing experience since it has opened their minds and their eyes to situations they had never experienced or had the chance to reflect. I teach at a private school where 99% of the students are white. It has provided us with extremely rich discussions. Many students have told me it's the best book they've ever read, and they've been asking if we can read another one from you next year. One of my students said he is now a better person because he'll be able to understand things he couldn't before. Thank you so much for providing us with such an amazing experience. You certainly made a difference to many lives. I'm sure they are all better people now. And as an author, you basically can't get any better than that. Um, so again, I want to thank all the, uh, the fans I had, all the support, um, you know, definitely HarperCollins. And I'm going to do one last quick thing because I told you I would not give you the seven hour version, but I did promise that I would do this. So I draw in uh, Adobe Photoshop with a Wacom tablet. So I just want to do a quick sketch of the character and then you can then go and enjoy the rest of your, I don't even know what day it is because as an author, I don't leave my desk. I think it's Saturday. Okay, so this is Jordan Banks. Uh, but, you know, it is, it's definitely been an interesting ride, and I have loved every moment of it. So here is Jordan. So as an African-American kid, you know, I, I wanted to make him one of the happiest, most creative um, kids that I could. And, you know, I actually got inspired. Um, you know, I read... Uh, a lot of Raina Telgemeier's books, uh, American Born Chinese by Jean Yang was absolutely amazing. That is also a book that I wish I had as a kid. Uh, when I stop sharing, you'll see some other of my favorite books behind me. Um, Octopus Stew by Eric Velasquez, I wish I had when I was a kid and I wish my kids had when they were kids because again, it's just an amazing book. And you know, graphic novels like El Defo, uh, Hey Kiddo. All right, and that's why I gave such honor to a lot of the graphic novels in Class Act. Thank 
you. There you go. And as they say, that's all, folks. Thanks so much, Jerry, for your wonderful, brilliant presentation. I know I speak for everyone present that we, the BookFest crowd, are amongst your most adoring admirers. And we all want to congratulate you wholeheartedly for winning the 2020 Newbery, as well as Coretta Scott King and Kirkus Prize. Um, you, the books are wonderful, and we wish you every success in the future. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you.